worship. It's been fantastic. Brother Fred, thank you. I feel like I have a new brother. Thank you so very much. Uh, I am uh, grateful to Brother Bob and Bill. What a great job that they did. And I'm honored to be able to preach on the same conference with those two men. Uh, I'm overwhelmed to get to have the opportunity to preach with Brother Jimmy Robertson. God bless you, brother. Thank you so much for what you said last night. Absolutely was awesome doesn't do it justice, but it was awesome. And Brother Dennis, I love you, man. That's my buddy right there. I think I told y'all I'd known him 85 or 90 years, but I was thinking back, I think it was 93. <laughs> 93 years. And I tell you, I love Dennis Terry. And Mildale, you got a great pastor. Amen. I, I know you will, but I want to encourage you to take care of him. Encourage him. Pray for him. You want him to preach better? Pray harder. You get mad at him? Pray even more. Get over it. Amen. So I heard one say... <laughs> Put your big boy britches on, build you a bridge, and get over it. Amen. <laughs> I know you will understand, but when I finish today, I'm going to need to hit the road. I'm going to try to catch a plane and get home to my baby love. I got the sweetest little wife y'all have ever seen, little red-headed woman. I love her so much. Been married 25 years. And yeah, we got married when I was two. <clears throat> Uh, but I can't wait to see her. Well, if you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 15. Now, we know this book is all about the Exodus out of Egypt. God had delivered his people from the bondage they were in under Pharaoh. He was using them to build his kingdom, and they prayed for a long, long time that God would deliver them, and God did. Can I tell you, God is faithful. I said God is faithful. He is a deliverer. I said he's a deliverer, and he can deliver you. Mm, yes, he can. I said he can deliver you. And so today, I want us to begin in Exodus 15, and uh, I'm going to start reading in verse 22. I'm going to ask you, if you will, in reverence to the Word of God, stand with me as we read. <clears throat> Exodus 15, beginning in verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. I said, I am the Lord that healeth thee. Amen. And they came to Elam where were 12 wells of water, three score and 10 palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. Pray with me. Father, thank you for such a wonderful time that we could come together and worship your holy name. Thank you, Lord, that your sweet presence has been abundantly evident in this place. God, thank you that you're here this morning. And Lord, since you're here, I would that you'd just go ahead and preach to us today. So Lord, just dismiss me and let us hear from heaven. And God, I would that all the praise, honor, and glory be credited to Jesus the Christ. For it's in his name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I love the record 
and the Exodus. I, I absolutely just love this book, and I love this portion because when we come to chapter 15, there's just been an incredible event that has taken place. Uh, in Ex Exodus 14, the children of Israel have come out of Egypt. Uh, they're headed to the promised land. They're excited because God raised up Moses to deliver them. Uh, God called a new pastor, if you will, Moses, and said, come lead my people out. And so he brought them out, and they're out of Egypt, and they're headed down to the Red Sea. I think I had the brother of the professor, Brother Bill, had because I heard it was the Reed Sea, too. I just couldn't find it in the text. Anyway... I'm a little partial to it being in the text in order for me to believe it. Y'all going to make me run a rabbit now. Watch out. They came down to the Red Sea, and here's this body of water, and all those children of Israel look back over their shoulder, and on the horizon, the dust is rising because Pharaoh's army is coming after them. And so they went from thanking God for Moses to saying, Moses, what in a free world have you done? Are you crazy? You led us out here to the rest. Were the graves not good enough in Egypt? You wanted us to be buried out here with a seaside view? I mean, what's up? And Moses turned to the Lord and he said, God, what shall I do? And he said, that, that staff that I gave you, hold it up over the water. And he did. And the Bible said that the winds began to blow. God parted that water. There was a wall of water on the right, wall of water on the left, and dry ground in the middle. You know, I did the Hebrew on that as well. And it means wall of water on the right, wall of water on the left, dry ground in the middle. Does anybody listen? You with me? Hey. You know what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11? It says, by faith, they went through the Red Sea. Hey, could, could you just, just, I'm trying to get to my text. Stay with me, man. Listen, by faith, I, I find that so amazing. God's just parted the waters, dry ground. I mean, there's a way where there was no way. Yet in Hebrews, it says, by faith, they went through. Now, think about that for just a minute. Now, you know if there was any Baptists in the group, and I am certain there were. <laughs> and one of them walked down in there just to the edge, I mean, just to where the water was, and, and it leaned in. <laughs> and he walked over this side, and he leaned in, just didn't get where it started, just leaned and, Wonder what's holding that up. I better get some boys back. I started to call some names, but I'd have hit somebody sure as the world. Better get my committee together building the grounds. Because we need to see what's holding that up before we go down in there. I mean, it happens so quick, it could just unhappen. You don't think that's possible? I believe that's very possible. I believe the Baptist committee got together. And they look, but look, that's that's what I'm trying to say. The Bible said by faith they went down. Just because you just saw the waters part, there's a wall on the right, wall on the left, dry ground in the middle. You, you didn't just go running down in there. Yeah, woo! Uh-uh. By faith. I believe they started down in there. Moses took out there. Now, listen, now Moses, all right, he knew. He went on down in there. But here comes the rest of them. And I just got to believe while they're walking there. <laughs> Wouldn't you? Man, I would. I'd have been looking at that. I, I'd have gone. to touch it, wouldn't you, bro? I'd have had to touch it. Just... I mean, it's a miracle. Don't, don't act like you wouldn't. You've never seen a wall of water on the right and a wall of water on the left and dry ground in the middle. You've never seen it. And by faith, they went down in there. 
I, I don't know. I believe the, the first half was, I believe the second half they probably got to shout. I said, I believe the second half they probably got to shout. Because faith was becoming sight. You see what I'm saying? I mean, it became reality to them. So they get down in there. And they come out the other side, and when they're coming out the other side, they look back, and they're not seeing dust anymore on the horizon because now Pharaoh's arm is down in the bed of that Red Sea. The dust, it was wet, so there's not a lot of dust flying up, but they can see them, and they're coming. And so they look back over their shoulder by faith. They've come through, and they turn around. What you going to do? I mean, there's a bunch of them. They can't all run and get away. I imagine they just stood there, and here comes Pharaoh's army. And lo and behold, the walls of water on both sides let go, and Pharaoh's army was all drowned right there at one time. Hey, the Bible said the bodies were rolling up on the side of the water. Listen, they were dead. And I want to show you something today that we find in Exodus 15. Because as I get ready to go and we get ready to close this conference, I want to leave you with a word of encouragement, okay? I want to encourage you. Be encouraged, church, and here's why. Our God is victorious. Look what the Bible says. Look what the Bible says in chapter 15. Then sang Moses, the children of Israel, this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Uh, verse 4, Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath cast into the sea. His chosen captains also were drowned in the Red Sea. Verse 6, thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy, and in thy Thy greatness of thine excellence, thou has overthrown them that rose up against thee. Listen, the children of Israel have began to shout, Woo! He destroyed our enemy. Listen, he didn't just deliver them, he didn't just set them free, but he destroyed the ones who had held them captive. Let me tell you something. We ought to shout the victory because we've been delivered, but we also ought to shout because our enemy has been destroyed. I said our enemy's been destroyed. The devil himself is a defeated foe. Well, some of y'all said, well, he's not defeated. He's still tempted. I know he's running around like a like a roaring lion. He got a big roar. But his bite's not so bad for those who know the Lord. You know what the Bible tells us in Hebrews? The Bible tells us about chapter 2 that he came, listen, in the flesh and rendered him defeated who had the power of death. You know what that means? It means that he rendered the devil powerless. Have you ever seen a tank? You know what, I'm not talking about a gas tank. I'm talking about a tank, like a, an armored tank, a battle tank. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Have you ever seen one? I, I've passed them on the road. When, no, they weren't driving them on the back of a truck. But I, you know, and I've seen monuments where they were set up. And I'm telling you, a tank is awesome. I, sometimes when I'm driving, I wish I had a tank. <laughs> Confession, good for the soul. Listen, and so, <laughs> but if you've ever seen a tank, they're awesome. I mean, they got that big gun barrel out there on the front. They got those big tracks on the side. And then if you're in front of them, they just run over you. They don't go around you. I mean, they're, it's my kind of vehicle. <laughs> but these tanks that I've seen, like on display in a museum or something, they look so awesome. But you can get in there and pull the trigger all day and it won't do a thing. That's why Jesus came. The devil looks bad and he sounds bad. But in Jesus' name, he's been rendered powerless. Anybody with me? The children of Israel shouted, Victory, because they had a triumphant Lord. I said the children of Israel shouted victory because they had a triumphant Lord. 
Let, let, let me show you how bad it got. I'm telling you, you talk about some unbaptistic folk. Verse 18 says, The Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the horse and, and uh, Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with his horses into the sea, and the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. I love that. You know what? It, it, they're just like us. I'm telling you, they're just like us. Some of y'all, some of y'all could tell me some of the highlights of LSU games right now. Some of the greatest. I mean, you ask me about Tennessee, I take you straight to 1998 when we won the national championship. Everybody says, oh, you living in 1998. Yes, I am. It took 50 years to get that one from the last one. Amen. I'm hoping I'm alive for another one. But listen, I'm just telling you, I can tell and we'll replay those things. We'll replay those things. And, and me and my boy you know, we, we have we, we like those Rocky movies, and every now and then we'll quote those something out of those to us. You know, help me, Mick, or whatever. Anyway, we just have a good time, and we, we'll say, and and that's how we are. We replay things. That's what's happening right here. They're replaying the event of victory. <laughs> that's their worship. That's their prey. They're saying, the Lord reigneth forever. The horse and Pharaoh's army, he's cast in the sea and he drowned them all. We came through on dry ground, but whoa, they got drowned. I mean, they're having a time. And here's where it gets unbaptistic. And Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. Y'all have a timbrel? What kind of church is this? Ain't got no timbrel. No timbrel? They don't know what I'm saying. A timbrel? A timbrel. That's what it says in the Bible. Tim King James, timbrel. Timbrel. It's a tambourine. That's exactly what it is. I can't believe we in a church ain't got a tambourine. What are y'all thinking? You pointing for it's in the nursery. <laughs> what are they doing with it? They're more praise in the nursery than out here. What's going on? Hey, Bible said Miriam got happy. She grabbed that timbrel. Whoa, she keeping beat with it. I guess I guess that's what she did. And she's dancing. I mean, she I told you I can't dance, I don't have any rhythm. But listen, the point being, she was moved. To do more than just talk. I get so tired of, well, I tell you, I just was thinking about praising the Lord. Well, won't you quit thinking? I tell you, preacher, I got so excited today, I thought I'd even say amen. Well, go ahead and say it. I don't understand this kind of talk. You don't mean it. You're not going to do it. Lord, if you said that, I hear it's lost people. They said, oh, I went in church and the ceiling and fall. Some of the Baptists said, hey, amen, the ceiling might fall in. <laughs> Lord, help us. But they went to shout and they went to dance and Mary and went out and said the other women followed. You know, can I, I just got to tell you, when that brother came up here and laid that money on the altar, listen to me, listen to me. I started reaching for my billfold because I won't in on that. <laughs> I see some of y'all did too. Isn't it amazing how when one person lived in obedience, other people followed? Mm. Don't mess with me. I want some of that. Don't just leave me alone. Preach you here to preach. You didn't have to give. I didn't have to do nothing but live and die. Listen, I want to give. I want in on it. Are you with me? I want in on what God's doing. And here's what I found. I can either get in on what he's doing or I could be a hindrance to what he's doing. Sometimes, sometimes, brother, it don't make no sense. You want me to throw that money on the altar? I, we don't do that, Lord. We're Baptists. <laughs> Miriam, straighten up, honey. <laughs> you got to quit that beating the tambourine and dancing. See, y'all laughing, but some of you, if somebody come in here dancing in the spirit, now I'm not talking about putting on a show, I mean in the spirit. Some of y'all would say, oh, she ought not do that. <laughs> what you're really saying is, I wish I had enough spirit in me to do it. But anyway, <laughs> y 
are tempting me now to get off on another point. Watch this. And Miriam, <laughs> and Miriam answered them, singing to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown in the sea. Can I show you something here? And you go back, you can read all those first uh, 21 verses. And, and let me tell you, the focus is what God did. You know spirits, you want to know if the spirit's in worship, if it is God directed. I said if it's God direct. If worship's about you, it's not real worship. But when worship's about our king, it's real worship. Verses 1 through 21, she dancing, hitting the tambourine, everybody shout. I imagine we'd think they had lost their mind. But to all of them, they were in the spirit and they were glorifying and praising and worshiping their triumphant God. Oh, to God that we would go and do thou likewise. Hadn't he already done enough to prove he's victorious? I know our world's in a mess. I know our world's in a mess. I said, I know our world's in a mess. But I know Jesus still sits on the throne. I know his hand's still on the throttle. I know he's not surprised or caught off guard. Listen, friend, he's still in control. He's still saving souls. He's still got people you don't even know about. I said, he got people you don't even know about. We ought to just praise him just because he's a triumphant God. Amen. Amen. Praise his name. Victory. Victory is his. Be encouraged, church. Victory belongs to the Lord. We not only ought to be encouraged because he's triumphant and victorious, but we ought to be encouraged because he's able. In verse 22, the Bible said, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. I don't know about you, but that's a bunch I'd like to have been leading because, man, they shouting the victory and having a good time. It wouldn't be hard to lead that bunch. They went out in the valley of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Mm. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the water of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. Mara means bitterness. And the people who had just been shouting victory, who had just been delivered from captivity, who had just come through the Red Sea miraculously with a wall of water on the right and a wall of water on the left. Those people murmured against Moses saying, what shall we drink? Can I just tell y'all, I am so glad we're not like them. Aren't you, Brother Dennis? Aren't you glad Baptists aren't like that? I just so glad. Some of you will be complaining before the sun goes down tonight. You know, I, I have always been hard on the children of Israel because of stuff like this. I'm like, are you kidding me? He brought you out of bondage. He brought you through the Red Sea. Part of you saw the wall, the wall on the right, wall on the left, dry ground. The and three days later, I said, three days later, three days later, because everything wasn't hunky dory for you. I don't understand. So I'm hard on them about that. But the Lord has been so faithful to show me I'm just like him. He saved me. He set me free. He's given me more than I've ever deserved. He's blessed me. He's comforted me. He's given me peace. He's met all my needs and then some. And yet one little thing go wrong. And I worry. I said I worry. I said I worry. I said, I worry. You know you can't worry and have faith at the same time, don't you? You know it's impossible to please the Lord without faith, don't you? 
So if you can't have faith, which pleases him, at the same time you're worrying, then when you're worrying, are you pleasing him? We're just like them, aren't we? I mean, we've been in the presence of God. Last night, I hadn't been in a meeting like that, and I don't know when. Spirit of God fell in this place. I'm telling you, it was all, I would have flat shouted a little more if I hadn't, you know, thought y'all would think I wasn't a respectable Baptist. I'm just kidding. I really don't care what you think. Anyway. I haven't been to meeting like that in a long time. I, I mean, I just, I couldn't sleep last night. I was just still full. I'm still full this morning. And yet something's going to go wrong and we'll be complaining before the sun goes down tonight. Some of y'all will be complaining by the time you get to church next Sunday. Sometime this week, the devil's going to work on you and you're going to get mad at your preacher and your Sunday school teacher and your neighbor and the person that's beside you, your music leader, whoever it is, and you're going to be upset by the time you get to church next Sunday. And you're going to complain. You're going to gripe. And you're going to be a smart aleck. And this is what you're going to say. Well, I'm sorry. That's just the way I am. Number one, you're not sorry. Although you may be sorrier than you think. And number two, you're just like that. Because you choose to be just like that. Because when you met Jesus, you're supposed to be like him. Yeah, oh me, I know. Amen don't belong there. Oh me, I understand. I understand. I'm with you. And so what do you do? You go complain to the preacher, and that's what they did. And we ain't been out of Egypt no time. They've done told him, what'd you bring us out here to the Red Sea to bury us for? Weren't the graves good enough in Egypt? And now we go three days and we're a little thirsty. The God who parted a sea, and you worried about water? A God who parted the sea is working for you are his people, and you upset because you didn't get a little bit of water. I'm so thirsty. It's just not working out like I hoped it would. Moses, what are we going to do? <laughs> Moses, what are we going to drink? I'm so parched. <laughs> hey, preacher. Hey, preacher. What are you going to do? Because they're going to come complain. And here's what we do. We go find somebody to tell. So-and-so's complaining about me. I'm just preaching best I can. I'm going to get the deacons to church her. Put her out of here. Let me call my friend. Could you put my resume in another church? You know what's so hard about that? All that's true. You say, I don't believe that. Well, then you're just living in a fairy tale world because all this is true that I just said. I've heard people complain about the most. <laughs> what you going to do? And he, being Moses, cried unto the Lord. Let, let me tell you something. There will always be something to complain about. I said there will always be something to complain about. Now, usually Baptists find the preacher while he's en route to the pulpit to tell him. <laughs> I don't know why Brother Rock doesn't come out and shake everybody's hand before sir. Well, I don't want to hear you complain and make me mad before I get in the pulpit. And I'm going to call your name and tell you what you are. 
I'd rather be alone with God and get a word from him to deliver to his people than listen to your long-tongued, baby gropping, complaining, cast for milk toast, devil-filled stuff. <laughs> and so we don't like to be complained to and the preachers like to complain to. And so what should we do? We should do just what Moses did. Just go to the Lord. And when you go and say, Lord, they're complaining about me, here's what he's going to say. They did me too. Matter of fact, he might just say, well, if you weren't yoked up with me, they wouldn't complain about you. Kind of makes you take a whole new view of people complaining, huh? Go ahead and complain, amen. If I wasn't God called pastor, you wouldn't be complaining to me, amen. I'm glad God called me. Go ahead and complain, honey. You can complain all you want to. You can complain all the way to the poorhouse. It don't matter to me. I'm going to preach his truth. <laughs> Moses just turned to the Lord and said, Lord, what shall I do? Listen, friend, if you're the preacher or if you're a parishioner, if you got something to complain about, take it to the king. I said, take it to the king. I said, take it to the king. Preacher, it's too hot in here. Preacher, it's too cold in here. Well, I'm not God. I'm not in charge of the temperature. But we have an air condition. I know, and I'm sweating. You think I care that you're cold? I'm hot. You know, I've been in church where everybody loved to go up and hit the Y'all know? Yeah, I put a dummy one out there one time. They hit that thing all the time. They say, I, I'm too cold. I said, go over and turn it up. <laughs> no, really, help yourself. <laughs> That's funny. I don't care who you are. Hey, listen. Moses turned to the Lord. He said, Lord, what do I do? You know what I found? If you have a problem, if you'll take it to somebody that can fix it, you get a whole lot more accomplished than going to somebody who can't. I can't fix your problem. At Bill Br I thought he was reading out of my notes because I'm not a very good counselor either. You know, if it gets beyond you need to get saved, I'm not sure what to do with you. And I'd, I'd bring them in my office say, we need some counsel. Come on in. Y'all know Jesus? Amen. Yeah, yeah, but let's tell you your problem. I said, look right there on the wall. You see, I'm an ordained preacher. <laughs> I look at my degree. It's in preaching. Now, if you want me to preach to you, I'll do it right now. But I'm probably not going to be able to help you with whatever problem you got. But I can send you to a counselor who will. Amen. See, I mean, I, I can't fix everybody's problem. You can't fix it. You can't fix your own problems most of the time, nor can I. We got to learn to take it to the Lord. Because I'm going to tell you, he's a problem fixer. He's a chain breaker. He's a need meter. There's nothing he can't do. And so Moses said, Lord, what shall I do? And watch this. The Bible, <laughs> I'm telling you, this is good right here. The Bible says, the Lord showed him a tree. Lord, they complained, and what did I do? You see that tree? <laughs> That's what it says. It's kind of like throwing your money on the altar, isn't it? I ain't never seen nothing like that. <laughs> Moses, you see that tree? Go get that tree. I got it, Lord. Guess all the complaining will stop now. <laughs> Who ever said that the Bible didn't have some humor in it? I'm just funny right there. That's funny. <laughs> all right, let me read it. And he said unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had... Cast it into the waters. I'm not going to throw it, okay? <laughs> Cast it into the waters. Which waters were they? These were the waters of Mara. The place, the name is called Mara. It causes bitterness. That's what it means, bitterness. Uh, the word Mara means bitterness. 
That's what this little body of water was called, Mara, because it was bitter. Are you with me? And when he cast the tree into the water, watch this. When he cast the tree into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Now, the reason that happened is because a tree is, uh, you know, it has wood and stuff, and you throw it into water and all the amoebas and the... <laughs> As a sweet tree. I've heard some non-evangelical liberal theologians offer some, op some options to what Scripture says that I'd have to have a whole lot more faith to believe what they said than what the Bible said. Like I heard someone say in a classroom, well, the reason that the Nile turned to blood was because it ran over red clay. It ran over red clay. Oh, it really wasn't blood. It was just... It looked like blood. I guess God would do that because he couldn't turn it to blood. I'm sitting here thinking, do you think I'm an idiot? The Bible said he turned it to blood. He didn't say nothing about no red clay. Do y'all see what I'm saying? Some people would say he threw the tree in and because of those elements that are found in the tree, it combined with the elements that were in the water and, and it came together and all of these amoebas and amiibos and all of these little cells worked together and all this moss came and all of a sudden it was just sweet water. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard in my life. God said, you see that tree? I got it. Throw it in. It had nothing to do with the tree. It had nothing to do with the water. It had everything to do with being obedient to what God told him to do. You cannot give me a scientific answer to why a tree. Well, we'd need to know what kind of tree it was. Bible didn't say, did it? Smarty Jones. Because it wasn't about the tree. It was about the obedience. And it's amazing, it's amazing to me that Moses turns to the Lord in the moment of trial and he shows him a tree. It's amazing to me, he shows him a tree and he says, throw it in and I'll make it sweet. Because see, there's another tree. I know a whole lot of bitter situations. Some of you are living in them. Some of you have a bitter home. Some of you in bitter relationships. Some of you have a bitter workplace or a bitter school experience. Some of you have bitterness in your heart. Listen, we got a country that's full of bitterness. We got a world that's full of bitterness. I want to tell you something. There is a tree. There is a tree. It looks just like that. And when you cast that in the middle of a bitter situation, it and it alone can make it sweet. Show me the bitterest life in the world. Apply the tree, and it'll be sweet. I've seen some people who were bitter, mean, just, just Mr. Grumpy, but the tree got put in their heart. Come on now. Once you get a tree that in the shape of a cross in the place where there's bitterness, it'll make all things sweet. Amen. The Bible said that when the, he threw it in, it made it sweet, and they made a statute and an ordinance there, and he proved them. And then Moses gave him a word, and, and this is what he said. If you will diligently hearken the voice of the Lord thy God, will do what uh, that which he is which is right in his sight, will give ear to his commandment, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon them which I have brought upon the Egyptians for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Listen, as soon as he did this, Moses stood up and said, look, God just did a miracle in your sight and it wasn't because of the tree, it was because of the obedience and if you'll be obedient to what God said, if you obey his command, if you keep his statutes, I won't bring anything on you like I brought on the Egyptians. You know, like causing water to turn red because it runs over clay. That's not what he said. The point is, God was making an illustration that obedience precedes blessing. 
We ought to be encouraged today because our God's triumphant. Secondly, our God's able. He can take any bitter situation and make it sweet. But I want to show you one more thing, and I'm going to be done. Here it is. Here it is. Lord, have mercy. Time runs faster in South Louisiana than anywhere I've been in my life. Our God, he is triumphant. He is able. And finally, his provisions are always sufficient. The Bible says in verse 27, and they came to Elam. There were 12 wells of water, three score and 10 palm trees. And they encamped there by the water. I have uh, just labored over this verse because I, I know there's got to be some significance in there somewhere. Twelve wells of water. Where have I heard this number? I, I, I believe there were twelve tribes of Israel. There's even 70 palm trees out there. Every tribe could have their own well and shade to sit under to drink their water. God's provision's always sufficient. Amen. Isn't that good news? Hey, God had it planned. Now they got sidetracked over here at Mara, but just down the road at Elam, everything was already in place. They tell me that Elam was somewhere between two and five miles from Mara. I can drive five miles in less than five minutes. I know they were walking, but you can do that in a day, half a day, a few hours. Boy, I wish we'd have known what was at Elam. We wouldn't have been so upset at Mara. God's provision is always sufficient. Can I get a witness? Then why in the world are you complaining at Mara? We've been three days without water. You less than a half a day from a whole well but we're going to sit down right here because I'm tired and thirsty. Really? And isn't that just like us? Man, we'll go to seed over the least little thing and we'll get upset and we'll get distraught because everything's just not our way, but just around the corner is blessing. Just around the corner is more provision than you could ever even imagine. Just around the corner, God's already set something up you don't know anything about. Why are you over here complaining? Let me tell you why, because you have no faith in God. My God didn't call me for destruction. He called me for victory. I said, my God didn't call me for destruction. He called me for victory. What am I supposed to do? I'm not walking to victory. I'm walking from victory. Thus, I'm living in victory. I'm just going from victory to victory. Why would I stop over here at this little skirmish called Mara that means nothing when he got everything I need right over here? Here's what I came to tell you today. Here's what I came to tell you. Don't you quit at Mara. Don't stake everything on the place of bitterness because God's provisions are right around the corner. I read this story about a missionary who had spent his life on the mission field overseas. He and his wife went when they were young. They had a family, raised their kids there. All their kids grew up on the mission field. Then they came back to the States and started raising their own families. The man and his wife stayed there. They, they never retired. They just worked right on through, just kept serving the Lord. And uh, one day his wife got sick and she died. And this dear missionary man, he, he said, well, I... I'm getting far up in years, and I'm going to go back to the States and be with my children. And so he bought a ticket to take a boat back to the United States. And the boat that he was on, 
was the same boat that President Roosevelt was going to be on because he had been in that country on a trip, and now he was headed back home too. And so there were bands playing and stuff. When he got on, he's a dignitary from another country. And so the president gets on. There's a lot of fanfare. And the missionary gets on, gets in his room, and they sail across the seas, and they come into the harbor of New York. And, man, when they arrived at the harbor in New York, you talk about the red carpet being rolled out. There were bands playing. There are people cheering. Thousands of people have gathered in the port because the president has come home. And they're celebrating his return. And I'm telling you, it was amazing. Well, there's all kind of fanfare going on. The president gets off. The crowd's going wild. And the missionary gets off. And he doesn't see anybody immediately that he knows. But he looks around. And, and after a few hours, the crowd has dispersed. And, and that missionary is standing in the middle of the port alone. There was nobody who came to meet him. He walked a little ways from the port and found a little hotel room. And he rented the room for the night. He went up into that bedroom and just a little motel room. And his heart was so broke. And he said he fell down on his knees beside the bed. And he said, Lord, I've given my whole life for you. I took my wife. We went where you led us. We raised a family. They left, but we stayed. I served till my little wife went home to be with you. And he said, Lord, I just don't understand. Tears are running down his cheeks. And he said, Lord, I, I just don't understand. I, I've given everything and I come home and there's nobody here to meet me. And there was fanfare and bands and everything when the president got here, but there was not even a soul here to meet me. He just buried his face in that bed and cried. And that man said, in just a moment, he felt a touch on his shoulder. And the Lord whispered in his ear and he said, son, you're not home yet. Don't you quit. I don't care what comes your way, don't you quit. Don't you quit. We're not home yet. But one of these sweet mornings, we're going to be home. And the band's going to play. And the crowd's going to cheer. And King Jesus will be exalted high above everybody and everything. What a day that'll be when my Jesus, I shall stay. Don't you quit. When you go and leave this place, the devil will attack, but don't you quit. There's going to be some bitterness, but don't you quit. There's going to be some negativity, but don't you quit. Because the same God that has walked among us this weekend is going to walk out of here with you. He's going to walk with you all the way till you get to his house. So I'm telling you, I said to his house, don't you quit. Don't you quit. God in heaven, my heart is so full today. Why you would love us like you do. Why you would provide like you have. Why you'd be with me all the way till we get to your house. Oh, God, thank you. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters here today. Lord, though they may be tempted and tried and though the enemy may try to distract and deter them, I pray in the name of Jesus you would give them the fortitude to press on because we know your provisions are just around the corner. Oh, God, let us never quit. Never, no, never, never, never quit. But may we press on for the kingdom's sake. And God, for that man or woman or young person that's lost, God, if there be one here that doesn't know you, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, they'd say, Lord, I'm a sinner. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. Would you forgive me of my sin? And I believe that Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. Would you come into my heart? Save me today, Lord. 
in Jesus' name. God, if someone here doesn't know you, someone on the radio or internet listening, they don't know you, I pray today they would invite you into their heart, believing in your death, burial, and resurrection for their salvation. God, let it be. Let it be. Let it be. Let it be. May Jesus get all the glory. In his name I pray. Amen. Very quietly stand to your feet. If there's business you need to do with the Lord, the altar's open. You need to be saved. Some of you already feel like quitting. Come on, get you another dose before you go. Say, Lord, don't let me 